This is the Stark Truth, hosted by Robert Stark, brought to you by the Voice of Reason Broadcast Network. Robert Stark is an American journalist and political commentator. You can read his articles at examiner.com. I'm joined here with uh, James O'Mara. Uh, it's, it's nice having you on. So you write for Countercurrents, and you also uh, have a blog called Where the Wild Boys Are. That is correct. I'm uh, glad to be here. So you would uh, best be described as a, a new right, a radical traditionalist, and you write a lot of, about uh, – you're a cultural critic, and you're in New York City. Uh, this is true. This is true. Uh, I guess the New York City part of that is uh, perhaps kind of misleading or surprising or something of, of that sort, because uh, I, I don't write the usual sort of cultural criticism that you see coming out of New York, uh, obviously much more in, uh, in lines of uh, the North American New Right. But uh, I am located here, been here for about 25 years. My uh, Origins are from the uh, industrial heartland, from Detroit, and uh, that uh, has a decisive uh, influence on uh, uh, the kind of cultural criticism I do, since uh, basically I think of my teenage years as being the uh, the high point of uh, white Western uh, civilization, uh, which is the viewpoint I've been uh, writing from on my blog, and uh, I've been continuing to write from that point of view both on the blog and uh, at uh, countercurrents because it seems to uh, uh, mesh nicely with the uh, the countercurrents uh, uh, perspective. So t- uh, tell us how you came about the North American New Right and how would you best describe that movement? I guess it's more of a – the New Right is more of a, a European kind of set uh, – European movement but I, I know Greg Johnson's site, Countercurrents, there's a lot of talk about a North American new right. Sure. Actually, uh, earlier this uh, this week, uh, Greg published a, uh, a sort of a manifesto on the Countercurrents site. And uh, reading it, there's a, a couple passages from it that uh, uh, seem sort of appropriate to my own project, you know, uh, anticipating this interview. Uh, as I was reading it, and uh, I scribbled down uh, some notes on that where he says that the primary project of the North American New Right is to challenge and replace the hegemony of anti-white ideas in our culture and political system. Uh, And he goes on to say, uh, our goal is to destroy this consensus and make white racial consciousness and self-assertion hegemonic instead. And that uh, pretty well sums up my own uh, <laughs> my own role in that. He does go on to note uh, that uh, given that the new and old left is functioned primarily as a vehicle for Jewish ethnic interests, it would be more precise to say that Jewish values are hegemonic throughout our culture, even on the mainstream right. And uh, <clears throat> that's that's pretty much where I where I kind of come in there. Um, because I think my project has been to, uh, from a traditionalist point of view, uh, you know, informed by the, the works of uh, Julius uh, Evola and uh, René Guénon, uh, to uh, to critique uh, in a radical way uh, contemporary uh, civilization, and that has really gotten me involved in a in a and a project of uh, sort of exposing the uh, Jewish or Semitic uh, roots of a lot of what passes for conservative or rightist uh, thought 
uh, on the left, uh, excuse me, on on on, uh, on the cultural scene. The idea here being that that no no project of of reasserting the hegemony of, of white ideas or rightist ideas can really succeed unless uh, the Semitic ideas have been uh, rooted out uh, from that project. And could you give some uh, in-depth examples of what those ideas are sure. that should need to be rooted out? Sure, and uh, that's that's exactly where I, I bring a, a kind of unique perspective, I think, on, on that, because uh, uh, I've been uh, focused on the Semitic uh, contribution of uh, a unique uh, homophobic uh, perspective. Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jewish and Christian uh, writers would be quite happy in other contexts to uh, even boast about how uh, the great superiority of uh, Jewish uh, uh, culture and thought in uh, avoiding that that that, that horrible uh, uh, faggotry of uh, uh, paganism. And uh, I, uh, in line with uh, uh, Julius Ebola, for instance, have, uh, on the contrary, uh, found the uh, the origins, the roots of uh, white civilization, white culture in a uh, male group, uh, what in German is called the Mannerbund, uh, a primitive or archaic uh, group of men uh, separated from society. Uh, who are the, the creators of, of the, the Aryan state and the Aryan culture. Uh, it's uh, unique to, to Aryan civilization. And as opposed to the uh, Judaic uh, model of uh, what today would be called family values. It's interesting. Well, that, that, so I, I got a comment on that. That's interesting. Sure. It kind of reminds me a little bit also of what uh, Greg Johnson in his book, uh, Confessions of a Reluctant Hater, his chapter on homosexuality. So the I- irony is the idea, we're talking about the ideas of family values, and it is tr- true, the irony kind of is that the anti-gay stance of conservative Christians has its roots in the Jewish Old Testament, but today it seems that the Jewish organizations are very pro-gay, while the perception is that the conservative Christians are anti-gay. So your point, that's what you're really getting to. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, let me uh, let me make a point about that. Uh, uh, one one thing that I that I emphasize uh, that um, it, it, it's characteristic in general of, of the Jewish attack on uh, Aryan culture to uh, play both sides. Uh, I, I sometimes on my blog call this the uh, Judaic two-step. Uh, it's it's the uh, the heads I win, tails you lose. Uh, position. Uh, the uh, Judaic position always wins because it runs both sides. I, I first noticed this back in the day when, when I was still watching uh, uh, talking head programs on uh, TV, like in, uh, you know uh, the, the Jim Lehrer's uh, news report and so on. They would always have two guests, and the two guests would have opposing viewpoints, and they were always uh, neocons, and they were often Jewish. And it's just taken for granted, well, of course, the Jews are smart, you know, uh, we, of course we want them as our spokesman. And it, it always took the form of something along the lines of, you know, you know, uh, Israeli settlements, uh, temporary halt or full speed ahead, uh, you know, along those lines. And there was, there was never, never a, a serious question of, well, gee, should Israel exist at all <laughs> or, or anything along those lines. Uh, both sides were always run from the Judaic point of view. And uh, what we've seen uh, is that uh, uh, both sides of, of these, all these issues are run from the Judaic point of view. The traditional conservative, uh, small t traditional, uh, you know, historically conservative position informed by Christianity and therefore by Judaism is exterminate the homosexuals. Uh, you know, the homosexuals are evil, they're obsessed with, uh, with sex, we, we have to destroy them and, and get rid of them. Uh, I was thinking today, actually, if you look at the Republican uh, primary candidates, you know, you have Romney, uh, you know, as a Mormon, is, is, is anti-homosexual. You have uh, Santorum, who's an evangelical Protestant. He's anti-homosexual. You have Newt Gingrich, who's a born-again Catholic. He's anti-homosexual. You have Michelle Bachman, 
uh, her husband runs a uh, clinic that supposedly changes homosexuals into heterosexuals. So they're all on the exterminationist point of view. Now, it might seem that, of course, obviously, the Democrats and the liberals and the left are on the pro-homosexual point of view. But they're not, from my point of view. They are on... Putting forward, and I owe this uh, this insight to uh, uh, a late uh, British uh, New Right thinker, uh, Alistair Clark. And uh, in my book and on my website, I, I uh, give many references to him. What is the name of your book? Uh, the book is uh, going to be called The Homo and the Negro. A, so it's, uh, it hasn't come out yet? It ought to come out next month. It ought to come out next month. Uh, the title comes from a sort of manifesto that I wrote uh, along these lines that uh, Ty Muros, who was uh, interviewed by you uh, recently, uh, put on his uh, uh, online New Right uh, journal, uh, Le Journal. And uh, just to finish off my thought about, about, about this particular issue, the left, since uh, Stonewall, since the 60s, has promoted what uh, what I call a fake, phony, gay, in parenthesis, in uh, quotation marks, identity, where they have attempted to uh, sort of draft homosexuals into the Great Rainbow Coalition as enemies of the Western culture. That is, is what's promoted on the left. And, of course, that's obviously opposed on the right, although they're, they're opposed to homosexuals in general. This has nothing to do with real homosexuals or real homoeroticism. Uh, if you look at the world before Stonewall, if you look, for instance, at uh, someone like Noel Coward, I have an essay on Noel Coward, a fairly extensive piece in two parts that appears in Greg Johnson's uh, book, uh, North American New Right, Volume 1, which was published this month, and uh, it appeared earlier on Countercurrents. Uh, if you look at homosexuals prior to Stonewall, while they suffered under the Christian domination, uh, they were usually people of the right. They were elitists. They were in favor of aristocracy. They were in favor of elitism. And uh, this was uh, co-opted after Stonewall into... Uh, you know, society hates you, therefore you should join us and destroy society. Uh, and this is the sort of thing that I've been trying to, to, to expose, to expose the fact that uh, the Jewish project has been to attack the roots of white civilization by attacking uh, the male group, the Mannerbund. So uh, and, the, and, does and, the Mannerbund have a relation to homosexuality? It is... It is uh, uh, there's a nice word, a phrase for it from uh, from Alistair that I can't recall at the moment, unfortunately. But I would say it, it is not it is not necess uh, it is it is not necessarily homosexual, but it is. Well, let me put it this way: if you take a look, it's very interesting. If you look at leftist critics and liberal critics of movies, I do a fair amount of movie criticism along these lines on Countercurrents and elsewhere. If you look at what they do with movies like Fight Club or 300, or Beowulf. Uh, a lot of writers get excited about these movies and, and, and see interesting things in them and so on. And the standard response of the left critics is, oh, it's homoerotic. Which is very interesting because, it, as you said before, you know, isn't the left pro-homosexual? Well, yeah, but you notice that they're always willing to, uh, you know, attack a certain kind of thing, uh, and they're perfectly willing to to use that as, a, as, as an epithet uh, when one thinks of the way that the, uh, the Catholic priest has been transformed from a figure of uh, authority uh, and, and goodwill, like being Crosby and, and so on, into presumably an un, a, a yet unindicted child molester in, in contemporary culture. What, what you see uh, is, is that they're uh, trying to to attack uh, any any notion of male bonding, uh, which which of course is what Jack Donovan has, has been uh, uh, discussing recently, uh, and any any kind of male bonding, and they've been been moving things toward the idea of of family values. You'll notice, for instance, that the left's version of, of homosexuality these days 
the PC version of it is what? Gay marriage. You know, it's it's the leftist view that we're all the same, we're all identical, everybody's the same, they all want what you want, uh, which would have come as a great surprise to any homosexual prior to, say, 1967. So you're opposed, you're opposed to gay marriage? Well, you know, I mean, if you're talking politically speaking or, or legally speaking, I mean, my... My position is it's just silly, you know. Uh, you know, go ahead and legalize it. You know, who, who cares? As a, 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 a an idea, I mean, I, w- I would refer to uh, Justin Raimondo, the uh, the libertarian, uh, who's, who's written a number of excellent pieces on this, and uh, uh, without quite having the same angle as I do, he he, he hits essentially the same point. It's a ridiculous idea. And, 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 you know, he emphasizes, you know, the, the idea, you know, what man wants to be married. I, you know, as he says, I thought the whole point of being gay was that you didn't have to get married. And, uh, you know, as someone who's old enough to have lived through the 60s and so on, I, I certainly recall that at one time that was indeed the whole point, that uh, uh, initially after Stonewall, uh, homosexuals were supposed to be superior to everyone because they were, you know, liberated from this family values uh, prison. And uh, I remember the slogan back then was smash monogamy. And then in this kind of Stalinist way, uh, that whole uh, position, you know, just like, uh, you know, the, the Soviet Union went from being allied to Hitler to being against Hitler overnight. Uh, in the same way, suddenly the, the leftist position became, oh, uh, homosexuals are just like everyone. They really want to be married and, and adopt children. How did that happen? Well, uh, to get back to what we were originally talking about, there you see both sides controlled by the Judaic family values, right? The the Judaic neocons on one side, the Judaic liberals on the other side. The Judaic neocons want to exterminate the homosexuals and make everyone heterosexual and have families. And the Judaic left says everyone's the same, the homosexuals should just get married and have children like everyone else. Essentially the same picture. It differs, you know, it's like Democrats and Republicans. Yeah, there's a little bit of difference between the two. So English them, but what is the cor- they do the same. The correct, correct and, well, not, I wouldn't say, I guess that's, depends on the person's opinion, but your opinion of the right answer opposed to the, those two answers. Uh, uh, well, again, you know, the, uh, you know, from the, from the legal point of view, you know, who cares or else, go ahead and legalize it and, and you know, let them marry and be damned. Uh, the, but from the cultural point of view, the, the, the point of, of it is, is, that, is that what's missing from both of these point of views is the idea of, of a male community, a male grouping, which, which may be homoerotic, but is not necessarily homosexual. It's homoerotic because it uh, idealizes and, and promotes this kind of elitist notion of what men can be. Uh, that's that's the, the unifying aspect. And that's why it's the origin of Western culture. Uh, I mean, this is not my idea. I mean, this goes back to people from, from the turn of the last century, uh, Hans Blucher, for instance, uh, uh, who was writing about the, the, the youth movement at, at the turn of the last century in Germany. Uh, which is the origin of the uh, uh, homosexual e- emancipation movement uh, in Germany at that time, uh, which produced, you know, oddly enough, on the one hand, the proto-hippies, and on the other hand, the National Socialists, uh, uh, which, which is an example of how, how the men's movement, as it was called there in Germany, uh, it has elements of the left and also elements of what we today consider to be the right, you know, so I mean, from the point of view, uh, you know, gay marriage. I mean, gay marriage is not an issue. It, it's a distra- it's a distraction. Uh, the whole point is that these these people shouldn't be worrying about marriage, just as you know, priests and monks shouldn't be worrying about marriage, uh, just as Plato's disciples weren't worrying about marriage, uh, except Socrates, who unfortunately was already married and he had all kinds of horrible problems with his wife. Uh, it's to take people out of that family values situation and have them do things like create culture. These are the culture-creating uh, institutions, uh, and it's not surprising that all of these are institutions that are constantly under attack by the left and the right as being, uh, you know, crypto-homo, right? You know, from, from the, the Catholic Church, uh, public schools, 
the Boy Scouts, uh, bodybuilders, uh, you know, anybody who is doing anything other than uh, getting married and moving to the suburbs and, and obeying Jehovah's laws uh, is under the stigma of being a homo. So you were raised Catholic. Do you, do you follow any religious belief today? Interesting question. Uh, not particularly so. That's uh, uh, an interesting issue, you know. Uh, you know, to, to the to the issue of uh, you know uh, the the lack, uh, as, as you know, Red Angan on and uh, Baron Evola uh, uh, saw uh, the, the you know the Catholic Church, Christianity in general, doesn't really offer any kind of. Uh, real spiritual sus substance, uh, the Baron would, would maintain it never did. It's, uh, you know, you, you find yourself in the position of, you know, being a traditionalist without a tradition. And uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of off on the sides here. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it doesn't sound too highfalutin saying I'm uh, sort of in the position uh, that uh, Baron Evola talks about in uh, Ride the Tiger, of uh, someone who is not accepting the uh, the secular world as it is, but uh, has not found any any traditional alternative and uh, tries to uh, uh, move on as, as best he can. Uh, you know, keeping one's one's attention on the things that matter, which I guess is what I'm doing with, uh, with my blog and whatnot. Uh, uh, you know, keeping one's attention on uh, the higher things, uh, hoping hoping for the best from that. Uh, but I don't uh, I don't particularly have any uh, currently existing tradition that I, I feel I can belong with. So uh, I guess talk more about uh, Evola and Guillon. Um, sure. Uh, well, um, uh, obviously. Uh, greatly influenced by both of them, uh, which is kind of unusual. Um, I know that uh, Colin Cleary, who's uh, uh, published last year a book called uh, uh, um, Awaiting the Gods, so that's not the right title, let me think for a minute, Summoning the Gods, uh, talked about uh, being influenced by Evola and not Gainon, and that, that tends to be uh, the way a lot of people are on the, uh, uh, the new right. Uh, Evola, for obvious reasons, is uh, much more uh, attractive to them because of his uh, uh, association with uh, uh, the Italian fascists, the, uh, the German <coughs> National uh, Socialists. Uh, but in general, his, his idea of trying to engage the world in uh, various ways. Uh, Gainon was uh, much more of a pure sort of French metaphysician who uh, kind of retired from the world. Uh, I guess I'm kind of unusual on the uh, on the new right uh, to the extent that I really, uh, you know, started with uh, with Gainon, and uh, uh, I think you know it's interesting if you know anything about the traditionalist scene, is that uh, the people who read uh, Gainon and think this is really great and go further and, and read the other authors they uh, they can spend their whole lives and never even hear of uh, Julius Evola. Uh, he's a complete unperson on their uh, on their side of things, uh, and discovering Evola uh, was was quite a, uh, a great event in my life because uh, precisely because it, it, it uh, you know suggested that it, that these ideas were not just something that you would uh, uh, accept and on that basis sort of turn your back on the world as being inevitably declining and entering a, the Kali Yuga and uh, there was nothing you could do. Uh, but it was possible that you could actually engage the world. And uh, that's that's what's uh, exciting about Evola's ideas. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, in a sort of like minor league way, I've been trying to do something of the same thing to bring these traditionalist ideas to uh, contemporary culture uh, to a certain extent, you know, what I've, uh, you know, taking, you know, if you read, 
uh, Evola's book, uh, Men Among the Ruins, he, he talks about the Niner Bund. Uh, actually, he never really does anything with it, but uh, I've quoted large sections of, of what he says about the Niner Bund in, in, in my writings. And if you listen to what he, he's actually saying, he's saying, well, you know, basically what I've been saying. Uh, there, there's a whole, you know, revolution of values in that. Uh, and, and just to, to turn off this, this, this line of thought here, uh, uh, I've, you know, been doing similar things uh, with uh, popular culture, uh, Noel Coward, uh, movies like uh, The Devil's Rejects and The Untouchables, for instance, uh, reading into them. Uh, reading out of them uh, various traditionalist themes, uh, you know, as an attempt to, uh, uh, you know, create a kind of traditionalist, uh, new right uh, cultural position, uh, so that we don't we don't need to just, you know, turn our backs on 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 the horrors of the Kali Yuga and its culture, but we can actually uh, uh, recuperate some of it and uh, make it our own. So you say, in literary terms, uh, Rolling Stones magazine has as, uh, played a big influence on you. Uh, yeah, in my uh, I had an interview with uh, Greg uh, that's on Countercurrents that'll be in the book, uh, where I make that uh, that point. Uh, the, you know, the being a teenager in Detroit in the early seventies, uh, which I think was the uh, the high point of uh, white. Uh, working class uh, youth culture, uh, and, and you know, subsequently, I mean, you can prove this quite empirically, from you know, objectively, from economic studies and so on, how the uh, uh, American industrial culture was uh, you know, torn apart after that. Uh, the uh, you know, I, I arrived at that for purely personal reasons. I, I set the uh, the summit in 1972 just for my own personal. Uh, egotism, and uh, interestingly, uh, you could hardly find any economist today who would deny that that's exactly when we- when Western uh, civilization peaked. I got to uh, ho- hold on a second for the break, but we'll get sure. we'll get back to this. Uh, mm-hmm. It's time for break. Please stay with us. We'll be back with the stark truth after this break. You're listening to VOR, ReasonRadioNetwork.com. All right, so there are some changes afoot in terms of the way we live life in the United States. It most likely won't be long before we'll be walking down the street or in your backyard and you'll look up in the sky and you'll say, it's a bird, it's a plane, no, it's a drone. Hard to say when and where this will actually happen uh, and also when it started, but we can follow parts of the paper trail. In February, Congress passed a bill requiring the Federal Aviation Administration to open up national airspace to unmanned civil and commercial aircraft by 2015. The bill gives funding to the FAA and assigns the FAA the task of coming up with a plan to make this all happen. Well, then just last week, the FAA announced a new set of rules. Essentially, they're saying they're going to make it easier and faster for government entities to obtain a certificate of authorization. And I'll just read you one line from the FAA website. It says, if the FAA disapproves a COA, the agency then will quickly address questions from the applicant and try to provide alternative solutions that will lead to approval. So the bottom line here is uh, drones are here to stay, but what will they be used for? And to what extent will privacy be taken into consideration when some of these local governments sign up for permission to use drones in their jurisdictions? Joining me now is Jefferson Morley, staff writer for Salon and also author of the book Snowstorm in August. Hey there, Jefferson. Uh, I wanted to talk to you uh, about this. Uh, Talk to me a little bit about the purpose of surveillance drones and and also some of, in your opinion, the worst case scenarios. Um, Well, first of all, we're we're talking about um, what the FAA is doing is opening up the airspace to drones of all sorts. And public safety agencies get first, uh, are going to be first in line to get permission. They can fly aircraft up to 25 pounds. When you talk to law enforcement people, what they say they plan to use this um, uh, technology for 
is search and rescue missions um, and um, uh, watching fires, um, uh, searching for um, missing people, um, that kind of thing. So uh, they, I've talked to a lot of police departments, and they pretty much all disavow any intention to use, um, you know, use these as, as, as surveillance drones. But they certainly have that capacity, and the law as it now stands is um, a little unclear on what the privacy grounds are. So you talk about a worst-case scenario. Um, some police departments have asked for um, uh, permission to have weaponized drones. Um, I think that's a, a bad idea and a, a, a worst-case scenario. Um, and they can be used for um, uh, they can be used for surveillance, depending on as soon as somebody wants to do that. So um, we need a lot more protection uh, to be written into the law right now. Yeah, I think a lot of it is just very vague right now, uh, and certainly there are situations in which some drones. Let's return to the stark truth, brought to you by VOR, ReasonRadioNetwork.com. Uh, welcome back. I'm here with uh, James O'Mara. He writes for CounterCurrents.com and has his own website, Where the Wild Boys Are. So before the break, you were talking of growing up in Detroit. So you were saying that that era... Uh, the early 70s, would you say the economic peak of of Amer America and Western civilization or cultural? Uh, well, both. That, that's exactly it. Uh, the, the economy was such as it allowed, uh, if you can think of it this way, that, that one's parents made enough money, even if they were just you know, screwing on bolts at an a assembly line, were making so much money that... Uh, the, the kids uh, were able to pursue their their dreams, and uh, a very interesting uh, youth culture uh, arose there, quite independent of uh, you know the New York Velvet Underground sort of scene or the California uh, Hate Ashbury's kind of scene. Uh, so that was going on, but of course uh, you know you also had Rolling Stone that was uh, coming out of San Francisco, and that's where we started talking about this. Uh, you know, I would naturally read Rolling Stone. Of course, we had our own Rolling Stone, Cream Magazine, uh, which exposed me to the writings of Lester Bangs, a uh, rock critic who has probably been the greatest influence on me uh, in terms of writing. Uh, but getting back to Rolling Stone, Rolling Stone. Uh, just in 1972, all by itself, provided me with uh, Hunter Thompson's uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, which was another great influence, uh, and uh, an, an interview, a mutual interview, as they called it, of uh, David Bowie and William Burroughs. Uh, and really, if you combine uh, Burroughs, Bowie, and uh, Hunter Thompson, uh, I think you'd have a pretty good idea of what's going on on my website. Um, and uh, of course, what I've, I've gotten out of those those uh, those influences has been somewhat idiosyncratic, uh, due to what uh, you know Nevola would call the, the personal equation. Uh, so it's an idiosyncratic uh, uh, derivation from those ideas. But uh, nevertheless, it's, uh, I honor them as as my my uh, forebears. Uh, and uh, as I say, I've, I've been you know uh, trying to. Uh, uh, read those, uh, you know, that kind of popular culture, or in the case of Burroughs, avant-garde uh, culture, uh, against the background of traditionalist ideas, and uh, uh, go forward from there. So uh, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, produce a kind of unique kind of traditionalist writing, not the usual kind of uh, traditionalist or new right uh, writing. Uh, but yeah, that, that that's a very uh, big part of it. Uh, of course, the uh, the role of Detroit, not just in America's economic decline, but also in its uh, uh, racial decline. Uh, you know, I was I was there uh, to watch what happens when a city is taken over by uh, the Negro element, and uh, you know, I, I read that forward. I'm not at all surprised at uh, uh, what modern America or modern culture uh, looks like for that reason. Uh, I've been there. I've, I've seen these people. <laughs> I deal with them. You know, I wasn't at all surprised when Obama 
uh, on the campaign trail in 2008 said that there were 57 states. Uh, I've heard that for years. So, yeah, that's the, the name of your book. What is the, the title again? The Homo and the Negro. Uh, it was, uh, as I say, originally a title of a manifesto I published at the uh, Kai Moros uh, online journal because I, I felt the need to get my thoughts in order at a certain point uh, with the influence uh, of uh, Alistair, uh, <laughs> Alistair Crowley, I almost called him, uh, Alistair Clark. Um, who uh, who passed away a few years ago, and after that happened, uh, I sort of felt I needed to continue these ideas on my own, uh, on my own website. So I wrote this manifesto, and uh, it has a provocative title, and it's intended to be provocative. And uh, uh, getting back to Detroit in 1972 and youth culture there, uh, I'm thinking of having as a uh, an epigram for the book, a uh, quotation from the beginning of uh, the MC5s, uh, album uh, Kick Out the Jams, uh, where uh, Reverend uh, Jesse uh, uh, exhorts the audience, "You must choose, brothers. You must choose." And uh, that's the meaning of the of the title, uh, which goes back to what we were saying before. Now, before we were talking about the Homo versus the the, the Judaic, uh, but the the, Ju- the Judaic shock troops are the Negro, and if you turn your back on the roots of Western civilization and its elitism and its aristocracy and its, its perfection of, of mankind, that is to say it's, it's homoeroticism, uh, what are you left with? You're left with the Negro, uh, the polar opposite. Uh, so it's, you know, the, the idea that the Negro is the real man. The Negro is a real man. Uh, you know, people who study uh, are, are wimps and fags. Uh, people who are polite are wimps and fags. And there's nothing worse than the fag, right? Because that's what the Christian teachers have, have told us, right? So, uh, you know, and, and those guys in the old days, Plato, he's a fag. Uh, you know, the, the guys in the Renaissance are all fags running around in pantyhose. Uh, you know, everyone's a fag except these, these exciting Negroes. Uh, they're so brutal and so animal. They're real men. And so we have a culture today which has essentially overturned all the standards of traditional Western civilization. And I'll use a capital T for traditional there. Uh, and what's the opposite of that? Well, the opposite must be good because this is bad. Uh, so the opposite, because you don't want to be a fag, is the Negro. So everyone must, must talk like the Negro, must uh, the, listen to the Negro's music, must dress like the Negro. Uh, and, and the, the point of this is, is, you know, so those are the those are the real opposites. It's never the Jew. I mean, no one would choose to be the Jew because the Jew is the the schleppy Woody Allen character. But behind the scenes, he's manipulating the white man to to destroy himself, and and he destroys himself in his civilization by by denigrating everything great as for fags. And by implication, you must become like the Negro. And once everyone has become like the Negro, the, the Jew will rule, uh, or at least will be comfortable. And so, yeah, you have on the on the right this anti-intellectual strain among mainstream exactly. American conservatives that if you're an intellectual, you're you're a lefty or you're a queer. But then on the other side, then they hold up that uh, being black is the ideal masculinity. But there is, I mean. Among homosexuality, there is a lot of homosexuality among among blacks, but it's it's sort of called on the down low. But they sort of adopt kind of a, a masculine, put on front of a masculine front, like they don't want to adopt, be part of, identify as gay, but they s- still engage in the homosexual behavior. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, it has to be on the down low, of course, because that's the uh, that's the epicenter of, of uh, homophobia. Is, uh, is black culture? Of course, we see that even today, even this this very day. You know the uh, 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 you know the whether it's in North Carolina or in California a few years ago. Uh, uh, you know who's who's leading the charge against gay marriage? It's it's uh, the black and Hispanic communities. You know we're you know respectively evangelical and Catholic. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, you see Obama. Uh, you know, falling on his sword for this totally, totally unprovoked, totally 
unnecessary uh, sudden endorsement of gay marriage. I'm still trying to figure out what was what was behind that. Uh, you know, when he was elected, the same election day, uh, California uh, threw out gay marriage. Uh, the same people who voted for Obama voted against gay marriage. And uh, uh, the same day North Carolina this year uh, voted against gay marriage, he, he felt the need to come out and actually endorse it. So you see the, the power of that notion on the left, which no one wants. <laughs> no one wants it. No one on the right wants it, and uh, I don't think any homosexuals really want it. So uh, it, it's become this kind of PC shibboleth. Um, but let me, uh, if, if I might, uh, just to, to, to illustrate here, uh, since we've gone into the, the Negro question or the, or the cultural question, this is an example of, of uh, uh, what Greg was talking about earlier about, about the hegemony of, of Judaic ideas, even on the right. And uh, I've made it a particular uh, uh, concern of mine to, uh, to uh, uh, address that issue, to, to critique uh, people on the right. I don't bother with the left, you know, just to, I just observe that they're crazy, but uh, to, to devote most of my critique to uh, people on the right, uh, for being, you know, talking about tradition but not knowing what tradition is, and uh, and for promoting, uh, you know, ideas that are really Judaic and consequently don't really get us anywhere. Um, for instance, uh, a piece I wrote recently, uh, uh, growing up in Detroit, uh, I spent a lot of time in Canada, which is right across the river from Detroit, and uh, went to school in Canada. So I've kind of kept tabs on Canada for a while. Uh, and there was recently a thing where uh, uh, Pierre Trudeau's son, Pierre Trudeau was kind of like the Jack Kennedy of Canada. He was this, this young and, and charismatic liberal guy, uh, and, or, or more like a Clinton of Canada, uh, although he came before Clinton. Uh, but he has that kind of reputation, let's say, uh, just to fill in your listeners. And he has a son, Justin, who is, is kind of this, this uh, say, uh, character who never really has done anything in his life. He's like 40 years old now. He's a he's a substitute drama teacher in high school. Can you believe this? Uh, you know, can, you could believe. You know, imagine like a a, a Clinton or a Kennedy. You know, being that you know that kind of non non achiever. And somehow he got goaded into now get this a prize fight with a conservative member of parliament who's a Native American, or what Canadians call a Native person. And Justin Trudeau, this, this, this wimpy little guy, actually won. And on the strength of that, he's actually being promoted as the next leader of the Liberal Party in Canada. Well, the conservatives in Canada went nuts on this. And... It's an example of, of, of you know what I'm talking about. Here are these these conservatives, and and they they hate Trudeau because he's smart and, he, and he's a, an elitist and he's got a privileged background. And their champion in this prize fight, can you believe actually settling political dispute with a prize fight? I love the idea. Uh, their champion is is uh, an Aboriginal person. So, so they're throwing their weight behind the non-white contender, and and attacking the white man for being, you know, uh, a sissy, even though he beats the black man, <laughs> which is just wonderful. And you would think that, you know, aren't conservatives supposed to be all about like elitism and, uh, you know, family uh, background and genes, you know, ultimately showing up? It's a real, it's a real conservative success story if you think about it. But that's not the way they think. They, they think, you know, we hate elitists. We hate. Uh, uh, I, I said something about it that uh, some commentators liked, uh, where I said that the only thing that conservatives hate more than uh, elitists is elitists that are more popular with the people than they are. Well, the thing about the elitists, they, well, the the the. I mean, so-called con- the so-called right, they're economic elitists, but they hate, I guess, the, if you tie in the idea with, I don't know my family, but definitely anything having to do, they're definitely an, uh, not, they're definitely in sort of the anti, anti-nationalist, 
especially ethno-nationalists, but they're definitely economic elitist. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They, uh, they're uh, you know they're they're certainly. Uh, I, I think um, I think Greg was saying in your your interview with him uh, a couple weeks ago that uh, uh, the, you know the, there's uh, uh, populism. Populism means uh, uh, a government that that rules in the interest of of all the people. Uh, and, and, and certainly the, uh, the, you know, the, the values that, that uh, the economic values that conservatives seem to, to, uh, to endorse are, are, you know, along the lines of the, the, uh, the sort of Judaic uh, free market uh, survival of the fittest kind of thing, you know. So, well, you know, if, if you know, 90% of the country is uh, in, in poverty and living on the streets, well, that's their fault. <laughs> You know, so that's uh, that. That's the kind of elitism they like. They like the uh, the kind of elitism where they think they can. Uh, uh, you know, somebody said about George Bush, he was uh, someone who was uh, born <laughs> born on third base and thought he hit a triple. You know, that's uh, that's their kind of uh, kind of elitism. But uh, just to give a, a another uh, uh, example of uh, of this sort of thing, uh, a writer on uh, alternative right. Which is an excellent website, uh, but uh, one of their uh, their writers was was talking about uh, visiting a, an exhibit of photos of 19th century coal miners, and he went on this uh, rhapsody about uh, how manly they were and and how uh, uh, we should emulate them and and so on. And uh, I thought this was a horrible. I wrote about this. I, I thought this was a, a horrible piece. Uh, you know, these people were were beaten down and and uh, s- squashed down by uh, by the mine owners. Uh, they were dirty and ragged. I mean, you know, certainly I, I sympathize with them, and, and you know, in their own way, they were were noble people. But to to actually hold up you know photographs of them and say, "Gee, I wish we had me- real men like this on on the right uh, today," I thought was 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 crazy. Uh, and uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, I opposed it to uh, the uh, uh, the sort of socialism that was promoted by Oscar Wilde. Uh, you know, the the problem with work is it makes people ugly, as he said. So we should eliminate work uh, rather than uh, try to uh, to emulate the ugly, uh, which seemed to be the the conservative position, at least as, as put forward by this gentleman. Uh, and I had a lot of fun with that piece because I was able to dig up uh, lots of, you know, getting back to the homo angle, uh, lots of stuff uh, about uh, Oscar Wilde's uh, tour through the United States where the uh, the American miners uh, thought he was great and, uh, you know, cheered him and, uh, uh, you know, talked about how his uh, his fancy clothes were actually quite uh, quite uh, utilitarian and serviceable for coal mining. And uh, he, uh, you know, mined some coal alongside them and, uh Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And that sort of uh, broke off into getting back to Burroughs and uh, the Wild Boys and so on. Uh, the whole. Uh, so that well, that's the name of your blog. Where the Wild Boys are. What is the like? I got. I got to read this. You say this is it's interesting. Aryan futurism, heavy metal, etheo, etheogenic mysticism, and pitless hordes of adolescent warriors and rainbow thongs. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Well, you see, it, it, you bring it up at this moment. That's exactly what I'm getting to. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, I, I, I branched off in that, that piece about uh, Oscar Wilde with the American miners uh, into talking about the American Wild West, which gets us back to William Burroughs and the Wild Boys uh, and and their clothing and, and so on. And, uh, you know, uh, I dug up lots of material about how how cowboys and, and Wild West guys, uh, getting back to the issue of the manor bund and uh, people and, and men, men not associated with, with family values. See, this is what the guy at Alternative Right was talking about, you know, real men, you know. Well, real men are not the men who, you know, survive under capitalist oppression in the mines. Real men are the men who are out west living by themselves. No Christian preachers, no wives. Uh, no school marms, and uh, how did they uh, live? Well, they, they, you know, I document all this in, in that particular blog post. You know, they, they wore long hair like, 
uh, you know, uh, General Custer and Wild Bill Coyote and uh, so on, uh, and Jesse James. Uh, they had long blonde hair, just like uh, Robert Plant, which gets us back to my uh, 60s rock uh, uh, obsessions. And, uh, you know, they they dressed however they wanted to dress. There was none of this, you know, dress like a man, you know, to say nothing. So how, how does rainbow how does rainbow thongs tie into all of this? <laughs> well, I mean, that's what I was kind of alluding to by by suggesting the you know wild wild fashions, but uh, you know specifically uh, that's that's a bit of uh, publisher's blurb from the back of uh, the British paperback edition of Burroughs' uh, Wild Boys. So it's it's kind of my my little tip of the hat to that. Uh, but you know, if, if you look at at the subtitle of that blog, I mean, uh, in in the interview I have that's in my book and that uh, Greg published on his website a few months ago, so your your uh, listeners can look that up. Uh, I, I explain how all that fits together. So it it, it does indeed all fit together. Uh, so what's on that that subtitle there is is uh, heavy metal music, uh, uh, drug induced mysticism. Uh, the Manor Bund, uh, Rainbow Thongs, <laughs> and uh, 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 Aryan Culture. Uh, if it sounds strange to your listeners, then yeah, it is strange because you don't hear about this. But if you actually look at, uh, you know, perfectly reasonable documented sources, I could even quote from uh, Baron Evel himself, uh, you know, the real man's man on the right. Uh, androgyny, hermaphrodites, uh, drug-induced mysticism, uh, sexual rituals, uh, male bonding. Uh, all this is at the roots of Aryan culture. And, uh, you know, to get back to our main theme here, uh, you know, the, the great opponent of that is the Jew. And uh, his, uh, his alternative offered to us is the Negro, uh, certainly the uh, sufficiently Protestantized Negro. Uh, what is the Protestantized that, Negro as opposed to what else? Well, I, I just uh, at that very moment uh, thought to myself, well, you know, maybe you know somebody might suggest that maybe the you know uh, you know if you go further back, you, if you go far enough back in anybody's racial background, I suppose you might find some stratum that's not affected by the the Jewish virus, but. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, you know, maybe 10,000 years ago there was a, a reasonably traditionalist culture going on in Africa, but uh, you know, it's completely irrelevant to our, our contemporary discussion. That was just a side note. Uh, every now and then I get uh, I get these uh, these uh, uh, feelings that I really have to uh, uh, you know back up my ideas or <laughs> be fair to my opponents or something like that. My blog is, is, is you know, is, is, is largely devoted, again, getting back to the idea of the influence of Hunter Thompson or Lester Bangs, you know, I, I, uh, I don't particularly try to be fair to my opponents on, on the blog itself. So uh, uh, I have a fair amount of fun, uh, you know, just saying things. Uh, but I think, you know, if you back me into a corner, I can back, I can produce enough old books to, uh, to uh, back up what I'm saying. Um, by the way, it, it, as far as uh, theogenic mysticism goes, I would I would say if you want a book, you should read The Chemical Muse, which documents you know how Western culture was largely created in a mist of uh, hallucinogens. And uh, online, uh, you can take a look at the research, uh, some of which is my own, uh, published at uh, egodeath.com. Uh, which again documents the uh, the role of uh, you know drugs and uh, other things that people on the right don't like in uh, creating Western culture. So you know you know the you know the, the problem is uh, you know what what passes for conservatism or a large measure of a lot of the right is uh, you know people who have, uh, are promoting a, uh, a fantasy of what uh, uh, the good old days were, uh, you know, if you read people like Evola or Ernst Jünger, uh, who, by the way, was, was quite a, a, a aficionado of entheogens. Well, we we're out of time, so I'd like to th I'd like to thank you for being on. I'd like to thank you for having me. 
That's all we have for tonight, so take care, and we'll be back with you next time. Thanks for listening. Robert Stark will return next Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern U.S. time. Visit our website at reasonradionetwork.com 